Thomas the Tank Engine is a British TV show, but you already knew that. Whether you're talking about the engines, the scenery, the model work, you can just look at it and say, yeah, definitely British. Despite its European origins, it would be a huge mistake to overlook Thomas's influence in America, and other countries for that matter. The stories and characters of Thomas have entertained audiences all around the world, and the franchise has flourished in numerous territories. Today, we're specifically going to be looking at how Thomas came to America and what its path on American television was like. We're going to look at each of the channels it was featured on in chronological order, all the way from Shining Time Station to... the one I really don't feel like talking about right now. I can tell you though, that Thomas's journey on American television is probably a lot more complex than you think. There were so many interesting facts and weird pieces of knowledge I gained while making this, and I can't wait to share it all with you. With that said, let's not waste any more time. Our journey begins in the year 1989. Reach for the speed, reach for the whistle, go where the rail may run. After the amazing success of the first two seasons of Thomas in the UK, it made sense for the production crew to expand their horizons and introduce the franchise to American audiences. But the question is, how do you bring a British television show with a non-compatible runtime to American TV stations? The answer is, Shining Time Station. To bring this vision to life, Britt Alcroft teamed up with American television producer Rick Sigelkow to create the live-action children's program that premiered on PBS January 29th, 1989. The show follows the happenings of a magical train station and the people who come to work and visit. Some of the characters include Stacy Jones, the friendly station master. There's just something about this place. Schemer, the psychotic arcade operator who's basically comic relief. <laughs> Take out the trash, make your bed, say please and thank you. <laughs> I mean, what does she think I am? Some kind of mature adult? Mr. Conductor, the magical man who tells the children the Tom stories, I have some time. I'll tell you a story about Henry, the big green engine. But I must warn you, it's a very sad story. <laughs> and a bunch of kids and adults who come and go through the course of the series. In the first season, Mr. Conductor was played by Ringo Starr, and he was succeeded by George Carlin, who assumed the role for the rest of the show. Although the show technically ended in 1993, Four specials in a spin-off series called Mr. Conductor's Thomas Tales were produced throughout the mid-90s, and reruns of all of these were on PBS until June 11th, 1998. On the surface, Shining Time Station appears to be your run-of-the-mill late 80s kids show, but I really think it's more than that. The humor from this show, while absolutely outlandish and ridiculous at times, is quite entertaining. Mid Smoot, what are you doing? Are you flirting with my schemer? A good example of the show's comedy is this episode where Schemer and Stacy switch personalities after Schemer wishes for Stacy to know how hard his life is. There's just something about this place. Then there's this other one where Stacy accidentally walks into Mr. Conductor's love dust cloud and um this happens. Oh, Schemer. Uh, you must be so tired. Working so hard. Can I give you a massage? In addition to being funny, Starting Time Station could also get pretty deep. There's this one episode in particular called Schemer Special Club, where Schemer tries to impress the president of a pretentious club he wants to get into, except the man turns out to be both sexist and racist. Ah, miss, would you kindly tell the station manager that I'm here? I am the station manager. I do not wish to speak to this girl, I wish to speak to the station manager himself. Herself? I'm the station manager, Stacy Jones. Just wait, it gets worse. Ah ha ha ha! Well, good for you. It takes such courage to be an Indian in today's world. We don't say Indian around Shining Time Station. We say Native American. To see a show like this deal with such serious topics makes me really happy. And then Stacy hits it out of the park with this amazing lecture she gives at the end of the episode. You walk into this busy train station and you expect everyone to just stop what they're doing and entertain you? Well, that's insensitive and insulting. And you know what the sad thing is, Mr. Hume? You don't have to be this way. 
You weren't born prejudiced. It's something that you learned from someone like your grandfather. And I feel sorry for you because of all the wonderful people that you'll never get to know because you think that you're superior to everyone else. Like, wow. I have no words. Shining Time Station was very successful, and at its peak, it was bringing in 7.5 million viewers a week. That's pretty impressive. Although Thomas wasn't really the focus of this show, I think that's okay. They sold plenty of Thomas VHSs as the show was airing, so if you didn't care for all the weird hijinks of the TV series, you could just watch the tapes. Nevertheless, it's really great that this show was successful, because this success is what helped get Thomas off on the right foot in America. When Shining Time Station left PBS in 1998, Thomas found a new home on Fox Family later that year. While it was on this channel, reruns of Shining Time Station aired, and various Thomas episodes were featured as segments of a kids' variety show called Mr. Moose's Fun Time. The show was about this moose puppet that tells zany and hilarious jokes to his human counterparts. Now, yeah, where does a car engine live? I don't know, Moosio. Where does a car engine live? In a motor home! <laughs> What has wheels and goes slush, slush? What? A carpool! <laughs> <laughs> and fellow racers, what did the car say to the gas pump? Car say to the gas pump? Tell me, what? You can't fuel me? <laughs> fuel me? Fool me? Get it? Got, Got it. it. Good! Throughout the runtime, they played short clips and episodes from other shows, all of which significantly vary in quality. We're not really going to talk about Mr. Moose's fun time since nobody really knows anything about it, and the theme song alone speaks for itself. Mr. Moose's fun time, Mr. Moose's fun time, are you ready for a silly wacky good time? Mr. Moose's fun, fun, fun time. A year later in 1999, another new show called Storytime with Thomas stepped onto the scene. This time around, Thomas was the focus, and each broadcast contained two episodes from the first five seasons and a music video. Britt Allcroft also used this as an opportunity to promote another one of her shows, The Magical Adventures of Mumphy, and an episode was included in every airing. It's not exactly clear how this show was received, so it's probably fair to say it didn't see as much success as Shining Time Station. Even so, I'm glad that Thomas was still able to reach American audiences after being dropped from PBS especially since the show was going through its golden years. Eventually, Storytime with Thomas ended on May 26, 2000. A few months later, reruns of Shining Time Station were shown on Nick Jr. to briefly promote Thomas and the Magic Railroad, but the show left the channel once the movie came out. We didn't know it at the time, but Thomas wouldn't return on TV for another four years, and when he did return, things were gonna be a little different. PBS Kids was undoubtedly the longest and most consistent home for Thomas on American TV. The show televised a whopping 15 seasons and 10 specials, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. As we all know, Thomas went through a major transformation in 2004. The show entered the hit era, where the goal was to make Thomas more educational by making morals integral to each story and adding the infamous learning segments. This new version of Thomas first aired on PBS Kids September 5, 2004. Between 2004 and 2005, each episode contained two episodes from either Season 8 or Season 9, and then one episode from either Season 6 or Season 7 in between. For the rest of Thomas's time on PBS, the innermost episode would be removed, and only two would be featured. You might think it's weird that they showed Season 6 and Season 7 episodes alongside the new series, but this was mainly because neither of them had aired on TV yet, and only saw DVD releases. However, since Hit Entertainment wanted the feel of each episode being aired to be consistent, Robert Hartshone composed new music for each classic episode they used, and Michael Brandon re-narrated Alec Baldwin's narration for the Season 6 episodes. And when the sun rose, he was still talking, and talking, and talking. I can't take any more! It's really easy to hate on this era for being so tedious, but I absolutely loved this show as a kid. It didn't really matter to me that the stories were kinda boring, since the format of the show was so fun and engaging. 
They'd start each episode with a sequence of Thomas getting ready for the day and read the Rev W. Audrey's letter before even getting to the theme song. Then they'd do a little prologue explaining what they'd be showing in the following airing, which I always thought was really cool. Today on the island of Sodor, we'll see the carnival arrive. Today on the island of Sodor, we'll see what happens when a shooting star appears. Today on the island of Sodor, we'll see what happens when Henry loses his freight cars. The most exciting airings were definitely the ones that featured season 10 and 11 episodes, since most of them never got released on DVD in America. All of this combined with the learning segments and songs included made for a great and memorable viewing experience. According to the wiki, it sounds like the show was only on PBS during the weekends until 2013, but I'm not entirely sure about that. I know for certain that it was on every weekday at 12.30pm following Caillou in about the late 2000s, at least on my station. After the new series ended, the series moved on to the ever so beloved Nitrogen era. The show retained a similar structure as it had before, but they canned the morning segment and the Rev W. Audrey's letter, so that was kind of a bummer. However, I praise them for keeping the Today on the Island of Soder segment and adding some Mr. Perkins content, so they got something right. In 2013, at the start of the Brenner era, Thomas got its contract updated as a result of an increase of viewers, and it was now on weekdays all throughout the country. The show continued on like this until Mattel ended the contract at the end of 2017. Although the show made it this far, season 18 was the last season that aired in its entirety. They showed most of season 19 in a few episodes of season 20, but the amount of new episodes shown in the US between 2015 and 2017 slowed down tremendously. Sadly, the same can also be said about the DVDs. It's such a shame that one of the best eras of the show got such little exposure, but that's Mattel for ya. Despite its disappointing ending, Thomas's time on PBS is very special to me. The way it was presented was consistently entertaining, and that's something I deeply appreciate. But before we delve into Thomas's next station, we've got a little pit stop to make. Between September 2005 and September 2015, Thomas aired on PBS Sprout, a 24-7 kids channel that was created by PBS in partnership with Comcast, Hit Entertainment, and Sesame Workshop. Unlike the other channels that would bundle episodes together to fit the 30-minute runtime, Sprout aired episodes individually. At first, they showed episodes from both the classic and new series, and eventually switched over to Nitrogen Era episodes until the show stopped being aired in 2015. I know I just gushed about how great PBS Kids was, but Sprout takes me way back. The style and tone of this channel was so appealing, and I have so many fond memories of watching it. However, the reason why it was so special to me was probably because I barely ever got to see it. Since it was a subscription channel, it wasn't included in the TV plan my family had, but it was available for about one week each year for free, around Memorial Day I think. I can guarantee you that I made the most out of that week as I possibly could. I obviously enjoy that Thomas was on this channel, let alone Classic Thomas, but I equally loved all the other shows that were featured on here. Bob the Builder, The Berenstain Bears, Kipper, Dragon Tales, The Wiggles, just mwah. Eventually though, they stopped showing Thomas and all the other shows that made this channel good. Universal bought out the company, it got a new name, it became a completely different channel, and now not a single person likes it. Wah wah. Nevertheless, Sprout was an amazing channel during its peak, and it's one I'll definitely remember. Okay, so back to 2017. When Thomas's contract ended with PBS at the end of the year, Nickelodeon picked up the channel and the holiday episodes of season 20 and 21 were shown on Nick Jr. as a special program. However, the show wasn't regularly aired on this channel until March 12, 2018, starting with The Adventure Begins. A very smart way to introduce the show to the channel, if you ask me. After that, they showed a good amount of episodes from seasons 19 through 21, which was great since those seasons got very little exposure on PBS. However, 
it wasn't long before all this goodness came to an end. By fall of 2018, we saw the release of Big Real Big Adventures. I'm just gonna say this now. After this point, the way the show was handled on this channel, and just in general I guess, was actually terrible. Since the movie wasn't released on DVD in the US that year, this channel was the only way for me to watch it. And since I didn't have a DVR, I had to wake up at 6am, the only time they were showing it, the Saturday the day after it came out just so I could see it. I didn't think it was terrible when I first saw it, but I didn't exactly love it either. Although the movie received a decent amount of hype, Season 22 got almost no promotion. I do remember them advertising Number One Engine and Thomas in the Wild as the movie was being shown, but even that was butchered since they accidentally showed what Rebecca does instead of Thomas in the Wild on the release date. How do you advertise an episode for two weeks and then show the wrong one? Just how? They continued to show some of Season 22 during weekdays in December, way after the movie came out mind you, but then resorted to only showing new episodes on random weekends throughout the winter and spring of the next year. It was painfully obvious that Nick Jr. wanted to get this show over with, but that kind of worked in our favor since we got new episodes of season 23 way earlier than we should have. This is gonna sound really weird, but I actually have fun memories of watching those new season 23 episodes as they premiered over the summer. More often than not, they weren't great, but it was cool to be the first to see new Thomas content for once, since it almost always came out in the UK first. From late 2019 to early 2020, this show gradually fizzled out and ultimately left the channel. Seeing that we're in the digital age, I didn't think Thomas would be making a return to cable TV, but unfortunately, I was incorrect. All engines go. Hmm. I don't like it. If you told me that Thomas would end up on this channel, I would have told you you were nuts. In September 2021, Mattel's latest creation arrived on Cartoonito, Cartoon Network's new preschool TV block. Since the Big World Big Adventures revamp wasn't quirky or original enough to appeal to kids or make any money, Mattel decided another reboot was the answer to their dilemma. Obviously. At this point, I'm not really surprised, nor do I really care. Nothing about this show is Thomas, so what's the point in feeling any emotion towards it? It's just an uninspired baby show that I have no reason or desire to be associated with. I will say though, it frustrates me with how accessible it is. One of Big World Big Adventure's greatest issues was that you couldn't watch the episodes even if you wanted to. They were on TV at irregular time slots, they received no promotion whatsoever, so it was ultimately impossible. However, with this show, Four episodes are aired each weekday, all of them are free to watch on demand if you have the channel, it was put on Netflix from the beginning, it's on DVD in America, and it's taken over the official YouTube channel. If this show had any substance, it would actually have the potential to succeed. Because of how accessible and in your face it is, I will admit that I've actually kept up with this show, for the most part at least. It continues to amaze me that out of the 30-ish episodes released so far, not a single one has been memorable in any way, shape, or form. I can't wait for the other 70 plus episodes of this totally not formulaic show to come out. No. It's just forgettable content they can keep mass producing week after week after week. Just sad. Whew, that sure was a ride, wasn't it? Looking back at Thomas's time on American TV, you really can't sum it all up in one word. There were so many highs and lows throughout the show that you just can't properly encapsulate it all. It's a shame that we're currently at a low and that we don't have any signs of improvement in the foreseeable future, but like I said, I don't think it's worth our frustration. In the grand scheme of things, does All Engines Go really matter? I sure don't think it does. For all the bad we've gotten, we have to remember the good. And there sure is a lot of good. Well guys, we have reached the end of the video. I thank you all for being very patient, and I think you'll agree that all the effort and research put into this project was worth the wait. I would like you all to stay safe, please consider subscribing if you enjoyed the video, and I will see you next time.
Thank you.